Um, it's a Civil War story based on a true, true story of a real American hero. Um, it is a, it's a world between two heroes who's a real person too. Um, but if anybody's interested, I'll put it in the back table. But I do have to leave early tonight to get that early so I can meet somebody. Um, but you know where I am? I'm always in a therapy. I'm always here next week because I'll be in the therapy room. Good morning. So, in each of your pots, there is a new coffee this morning. So, I just want to kind of raise your hand to see if anyone likes it. Okay. Yeah. It's outstanding, right? So, in a roundabout way, we are supporting a mission in San Juan. Um, it's a coffee we found um, being brought into the United States through a church in New Ulm, Minnesota. <laughs> For the San, it's a monster of the San Juan Mission. I won't go into. I can't pronounce it even after 12 years of Spanish. Um, <laughs> bags are available. If anyone has an interest, we can put the order together. Uh, they are a little bit more affordable than the monks' coffee. I hate to say. But we did a one-pound bag for ten dollars. So they have a 50-pound bag that we could use here, but it, it was just it seemed to be a little bit too expensive, so I'm going to get, negotiate with them. Um, but they do have some varieties, ground and ground. So if anybody has an interest in that, just let me know, and we'll work out something, either an order sheet or whatever. But if, uh, we want to make sure it passed the taste test this morning. So thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Same floor that my mother was on. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll say a prayer for those who are in transition to their life, my daddy. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'm going to use the old prayer of the Holy Spirit found in the old Baltimore Catechism. And you might remember it because some of you are. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's small response. So. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them in the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. We shall renew the face of the earth. That part I don't remember. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. You had it right there. <laughs> Let us pray. O oh God. spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, very good. Baltimore Catechism, of course, it has been uh, superseded now by many other catechisms. Uh, uh, 
60 years ago, uh, right after the Second Vatican Council, there was an explosion of, of catechisms. Uh, um, and then uh, about 10 years later, there was uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, the formal catechism, not in question and answer uh, format. And then in the early 2000s, the bishops of the United States of America issued uh, a catechism, a very, very good and delightful one, uh, called uh, the United States Catholic Catechism for Adults. Okay, if you, if you never heard of it, uh, look for it, the United States Catholic Catechism for Adults. It's a, it's a great catechism, and what I like, there, there's like 36 chapters, and each chapter uh, deals with uh, some uh, doctrinal aspect of the faith, but they begin each, each chapter with a little biography or a little detail, either of a saint that represented that, or of uh, Catholic, you know, people that have not been declared saints, but whose lives re reflected uh, what that particular chapter was about. And it's a wonderful study catechism. Uh, a catechism, it has uh, summaries of the main teachings at, at the end of each chapter, and it has question and answers that you can use. You can use it then as a, a study manual. Uh, so it's a, it, 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 those who have gone through Alpha, it's a wonderful, would be a wonderful follow-up to uh, Alpha program. If you would have people that would like to get into, um, well, what does the Catholic Church teach about this or that, or, or that, especially in your, your groups if uh, you didn't come across that. So, <clears throat> now, take it out. We've finished <laughs> the video. I hope you learned something because as I said in the beginning that the Torah, Law of Moses, first five books of the Bible, and the third one, the central one, was the book of the book of Leviticus. Okay, and uh, you know, and we looked at you know there was a lot of laws and so on. Uh, so I, I tried to pull out uh, not those the laws that were a little repetitive and have been abrogated since the uh, they burned out the ton temple, but that, uh, connections with with even some of our Catholic uh, liturgy and liturgical practices and so on. Uh, so. I hope that you listen carefully now. And for instance, when you we have the, the prayers of the offertory, and the priest says in the prayer, accept these oblations which we offer to you. There was a whole section in Leviticus on oblations. Okay? They were offerings of the people to Almighty God. So you kind of listen for some of those things. Now, Lent is starting. Don't be like, you know, people a few years ago, they called up on Thursday after Ash Wednesday. Oh, we couldn't make it for Ash Wednesday. Can we still get ashes? <laughs> it's called Ash Wednesday for a reason. Show up on Wednesday. <laughs> you know, it's the beginning. I hope you had good. So you miss Mass. Now, here's another interesting thing. A lot of people think Ash Wednesday is the only day of obligation. It's not. It's not. No. And, and during Lent, there's two or three uh, almost like sub-holy days. In some countries, at least one of the is a holy day. March 25th 
Annunciation. Nine months before Christmas. <laughs> you need to do the math, okay? Okay, so that's, in some countries that is Holy Day. Two others that are connected with Spain. They are not Holy Day. St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. And St. Patrick's Day. And St. Joseph's Day. And St. Joseph's Day. Thank you very much. Yes. And particularly in our diocese, this year, uh, Bishop Rickon has announced, uh, starting on March 19th, St. Joseph's Day, uh, this will be a year of St. Joseph for our diocese. And, of course, you know we have a national shrine to St. Joseph in our diocese. You know where it is? On the campus of St. Saint Saint Orbit College. You know, what was St. Joseph's Parish on the campus? And so that's actually a national shrine. So that and, of course, for some, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, bishops have to kind of contend with people calling up. And uh, you pass the ball tournament, in, you know, on St. Patrick's Day on Friday. Can we meet me? Bishop? <laughs> and if they are bishops with any Irish uh, background, oh yeah, go ahead. You're right. <laughs> so, uh, no. Well, maybe ne next week, depends how far we get this morning, <coughs> start a, a, a new program, uh, uh, Basic Bible 101. So it's a good, good opportunity to draw in other people, to, you know, exercise your discipleship of evangelization. Okay, invite people, you know, to, to, to come in, huh? right? So, now... That's when I start working on my taxes. You start working on your taxes. We are supposed to, you know, Lent is a penitential season. So I can, I, I can understand that. Okay, what does Lent mean to you? New beginning. Lent. New beginning. Renewal. Renewal. Preparation for Easter. Anything else? Do you have any special you have any special preparation before Lent starts? You mean fat Just thinking about it? Fat Tuesday. Fat Tuesday. <laughs> figure out which daily thing you're going to do. There's so fit, many out there. Figuring to figure out what daily Buy a lot of canned tuna. <laughs> Buy a lot of canned tuna. Do we have a nutritionist here? We've got to have a couple doctors here. But... Okay. Uh, the reason why I ask that is that uh, there used to be uh, a pre Lent preparation in the practice of the church. And it was called Septuagesima. You heard that, huh? So. Seven weeks before. Septuagesima. I think there's an M in there. Yeah, probably. Yeah, seven. And it corresponds to. The seventh Sunday. No, actually, it corresponds to Lent is forty days, right? Yes. <laughs> but it's it corresponded to seventy days. Okay. 
So to get people ready. Now, there was Septuagesima, Sexagesima, and Quinquagesima, leading into uh, Quadragesima. Quadragesima, 40 days, which we correspond with first, the first Sunday of Lent. So it, they had <laughs> three weeks of countdown before. Septuagesima, uh, Sexagesima, which is 60 days before. Quinquagesima, 50 days, yeah. And Quadragesima, which is the, actually the, what we call first Sunday of Lent. Um, and then uh, they got into it. Now, uh, starting with Ash Wednesday, Ash Wednesday started what they called Shrove time. Shrove Tide. The beginning of Shrove Tide. So, uh, you've heard it. What does it mean to be shriven? Remember that? Divested. Divested. Shriven? Tied, or to be reduced. Uh, or gotten rid of. Right. Yeah. Gotten rid of what? Your sins. Okay. So, uh, Because in the priest manuals, what did the priest primarily have to do during the Lenten season? To sh shrive people, to hear confessions, assign a penance, give absolution. Hear a penance, got it. Uh, assign a penance, uh, hear confessions, assign a penance, and, and give absolution. And then whoever came, they were shriven of their guilt through repentance and the forthcoming days of glad tidings uh, with the rigors of Lent. And a lot of times people uh, tried to do this before Lent started, before Ash Wednesday. Okay, uh, so uh, did you ever hear of Hal Monday? Or Hail Monday? Uh -uh. You heard of Halloween, right? Oh, yeah. So Hail Monday was the Monday before Ash Wednesday. And, and it was kind of correspond to Mary Monday. And uh, people uh, in Europe and so on, they began to clean out their pantries. Uh, <laughs> to prepare for the Lenten fast. Uh, uh, some countries call it the Carling, Carling uh, Sunday, or Blue Monday, or Pancake Monday. <laughs> so you take what's in your pantry and you make pancakes to get rid of it, okay. Carling, that was you took care of. We, our younger priests don't know about this, but we used to have uh, a, a priest, uh, oh, we still have priest support groups that a priest would get together, but there was one priest support group and every uh, Monday before Ash Wednesday, they had a game farm north of Shyokton and they would invite all the priests to come for a big feast. And of course, with a lot of beverages and play cards. So the priest had their Mardi Gras on Monday before Mardi Gras. Okay. Uh, but all those priests who, who did that are dead now, so we don't have that. <laughs> Mardi Gras, huh? uh, carnival celebration, people uh, feasting with which 
food before they empty out and, and have to clean up the mess. Uh, now, let's uh, take a look. I said this some years ago. The word let, word let comes from where? Do you know? It's not Latin. Anglo-Saxon. Lenian. Lengthen. Lengthen. Anglo-Saxon term lengthen. Why? Because they saw the lengthening of days. And it was accorded Lengthening of daylight. Something that we observe coming here probably this morning, right? Yeah. Uh, and I usually, oftentimes I, I tell uh, people, take a note and I ask Wednesday what the weather conditions were. Because in six short weeks, Easter will be here, and Easter is always in springtime, right? <laughs> Although it might not look like it, but it's, it's you know, springtime here in Wisconsin. Uh, but the lengthening of days, they saw that. And, and so theologically, there developed uh, the identification of <laughs> the days of Lent with like a 40-day retreat. And, uh, of course, there, there's other days within Lent, or Sundays within Lent, that uh, have special names, uh, right? Uh, Leitare Sunday is... Midway. Leitare. Which Sunday of Lent? Fourth? Third. In the middle. Fourth Sunday. Right? And uh, we change the vestment color to? <laughs> Some priests don't wear pink. <laughs> I don't care what you say. It put the same color on a woman and then you call it pink. Father, some Unitarian seminar in Dallas out in July, and the priests always wear pink liturgical pink at those masses that week because it brings in a lot of uh, people that are there that like pink and then they are generous. Uh, and then Loosens up the coffers or is it first strings? So, why is it called Leitare? Any of you remember your Latin? You don't remember your Latin? Okay. Because the introit, today we call it the opening prayer. Years ago we called it the introit. In Latin, in Latin Mass, started Leitare de Jerusalem. Rejoice, O Jerusalem. So it's rejoice. And rejo to rejoice, why? Because, yeah, someone mentioned it before, Lent is half over. You always used to Try to tell them. But mom, Sundays in Lent, they don't count. Right. We can, you know, eat whatever, you know. Sundays don't count. Please make something besides tuna fish and macaroni. 
or mashed potato and cream peas. <laughs> that was before there was something called cheese pizza. <laughs> There's an ancient, ancient custom in some countries in Europe, they call the fourth Sunday of Lent Mothering Sunday. Mothering. Mothering Sunday. Okay. Ever hear that? No. You did? Well, I'll tell you. Um, on that Sunday, uh, and I'm not sure if in the old Roman Missal it came close to the feast day of the saint. And it's the Saint Jesus' grandma, Saint Anne. And uh, on Mother Sunday, Fourth Sunday of Lent, there was a custom in parishes where they they try to get roses. And at the end of the mass, people would be invited would be invited to come up and take a rose uh, and give it to their mothers. So the rose from the altar to give to their mother in honor of like, St. Anne. Also, also in many places in, in Europe, uh, people had little shrines, especially if it was further away from the, from the parish church and so on, little shrines. But on the fourth Sunday, they called it Mothering Sunday, and it, all the Catholics were encouraged to go to their mother church the main church, uh, and then the, you get a rose to give to your mother. And of course I was, that was way before 1914, when President Woodrow Wilson declared that the, the second Sunday of May to be Mother's Day. Uh, and that was really an idea of Anna Jarvis. <coughs> Okay, and Woodrow Wilson only made it a perfect. Okay, now, not to be left out, uh, in, in some places in Europe, this is called uh, Re Refection Sunday. Uh, refection, you know, connected with refreshment or repass or confections. Uh, so making sweet things, especially semel cakes, and usually it happened like in the mid of March, which is the feast day, one of those minor holy days of Saint, not Patrick, Joseph, Joseph. So around the time of Saint Joseph uh, feast day. Okay. Um, Name. But it's the week before Passion Sunday or Palm Sunday. So in a lot of parish parishes, uh, they used to do, do this and then and they cut it down. And now a lot of parishes are doing it again. What is the change that you see on the fifth Sunday? Any of you work with uh, decorating? And cover the statue. All right, Karen. The covering of the, cross. the crosses and statues and icons and so on, uh, and you know that actually it comes from in the Gospel of John, chapter eight, uh, verse fifty-nine. Uh, I think after Jesus heals a man, uh, that. Uh, People picked up stones and were going to stone him, but he um, he slipped away and hid himself in the crowds. And in the Gospel of John, it, it, it's like two weeks before the uh, his uh, Passion Week, so it's it has in some people's uh, uh, the veiling of the. Uh, statues and so on <coughs> corresponds to something scriptural, right? Then we get, of course, the tritium after that, huh?
three days. We call it Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil. Uh, and these d developed over time into something special. Uh, I'm going to kick it into some of the earliest practices. When did this all start? As early as the third and fourth centuries, uh, faithful uh, were asked to, to fast and join actually the catechumens, the catechumens in fasting. Uh, but usually it was just one or two days, one or two days in Lent. Uh, there's a one of the patristic writings is called the Apostolic Tradition. All right? It dates to, I think, the second or third century, Apostolic Tradition. And it, in there, it's written that there's two days of fasting before the celebration of the Lord's uh, resurrection. So, then it was actually the Council of Nicaea. Nicene Creed, Council of Nicaea. So one of the other things that that produced besides the Nicene Creed that we say uh, Sunday Mass is 40 days for Lent. 40 days of Lent. Uh, and by the, uh, the Council of Laodicea in 360, it was observed everywhere in the East and in the West. 40 days, and, and kind of tied in with 40 days in the desert before he started his, you know, public ministry, tempted at the end uh, by the devil and so on. So uh, the connection with 40 days for Lent, it goes way back, huh? It goes way back. Uh, now, there, there's a little bit of a difference uh, in the West, Roman Catholic Church, we basically have six weeks of Lent. Sundays don't come, right? In the East, if you notice uh, many times, the Eastern Rite Christians, Orthodox, if you will, or various branches thereof, they will have Easter later than we will ever know sign, depending on the, uh, the calendar and when they start. And that's because in the, in the East, they had seven weeks, Saturday and Sunday didn't come. Okay? So that got pushed back. Uh, I recall 1974, when, when my classmates and I were studying there, we had that was one of the years when uh, the Orthodox Easter and the Roman Easter corresponded, and they were the same week. Hmm. And one of our Benedictine professors came in and flew in three weeks ahead of time, and he was an expert in the Orthodox uh, liturgies. <laughs> so he explained the various Orthodox uh, celebrations uh, uh, corresponding to the Holy Week, what we call the Tritium and, and so on. And then we went to some of those celebrations. It was, it was absolutely uh, astounding. I'd never forget some of those celebrations. And maybe later on in Easter, I'll tell you about some of them, or, or in Lent. I won't get into it now, but it was uh, outstanding. Now, uh, fast, fasting. Let's talk about fasting a little bit. Uh, uh, particularly during the mid medieval times, the middle, the, the, there was church and state uh, forbid public entertainment, festivals, even you know, in some feudal courts, everyone wore black as Alfred sign that they're, you know, doing penance or whatnot. But uh, 
they, the fasting was more strict. And you ate only one meal a day. And no meat flesh. No meat flesh. No fish. No eggs. No dairy. Yeah. So it was, and one meal a day. All right. So, um, so what pray tell me? Pretzels. Pretzels. Did you ever hear the origin of pretzels? Huh? You, you probably did. Well, German, but the German monks adopted it from Italian monks. And Italian monks, uh, because there was gold in the monastery in spring, uh, before spring and so on, and monks, when they went for their liturgy of the hours, they had those big sleeves in their cowls, and they always, That's for to keep. Guess where they put their hands, like that. So uh, during Lent, when they could use and twist some bread into these nice shapes and put salt on, which was okay, uh, the Italians called these shapes and forms bracciale. Okay. When they came to Germany, the Germans uh, transliterated the Italian bracciale to pretzel, a pretzel. That's where we get pretzel from. But it's it means little praying hands, basically pretzels. Okay. So if there's any snack food you want to do during Lent, pretzels. Now don't. But they, they didn't have cheese back then, or they had cheese, they couldn't do dairy. Now, the other thing is, you could always eat, if you can get a hold of it, uh, foods that were in the Bible. Okay? So, dates and figs. You needed a little sweet dates and figs. Real sweet, very nutritious, right? Huh? Very satisfying. Okay. No. So, and I'm wondering if Big Newtons count. <laughs> That would work? Raisins? Craisins? Well, they didn't have them in Europe. Uh, what's that story next to? There's a story told uh, when the Europeans, especially came, uh, you know, uh, this way, and of course, the French fur trappers and so on, and the voyeur, uh, voyageurs, uh, they brought in French after them to, to be missionaries to, to the Native Americans. And the, uh, the, the French Jesuits sent detailed reports back to Europe all the time. They're called the Jesuit Relations, okay? And there's, there's reams and reams and reams of these reports about the Native American tribes and, and so on that they were trying to, but they came across an animal that they didn't see in Europe. And it spent part of its day in the water and part of, part of it on land. And they didn't know whether it, it was fish or uh. animal or, 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 or if they could eat it during Lent. So they petitioned the Vatican. And they went to the Jesuit relations to, to get, and, and they said, well, let's, you know, do, do they have toes? Well, they have webbed feet. 
and they they go in the water, you know, all of them, most of the time, uh, and, and tails, and, and so on. So they got permission that they could eat. Not beaver. Muskrat. Muskrat. According to their description. Of course, they couldn't take a picture of it and send it to the back. So, so if you come across muskrat uh, during Lent, you know, uh, you're not finding it. Uh, so, let's see. Of course, the, the main purpose of Lent is um, collectively. For us, and you know, and we will hear over and over again uh, from the first words of Jesus. The first words of Jesus is found in any of the Gospels. Of course, is in the Gospel of Mark. Right? You got Bibles? Let's, let's take a look at it, so you know that we got the Gospel of Mark. Here's the oldest Gospel, right? Chapter one. Verse 14 and 15. So, and it comes as Mark lays it out. After John had been arrested and Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Proclaiming, of course, in Greek is euangelion. Okay, proclaiming uh, the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Repent and believe in the gospel. So, repent. Repentance. That has... Uh, Lent has always been a time of repentance along with spiritual discipline, spiritual practices, ascetical practices. And the whole idea... And maybe that's why, you know, years ago, you, you may remember, they had, they had Stations of the Cross more often. Uh, here, my Darboy friends, remember? Wednesday night, 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon. Wednesday night, 2 o'clock Sunday afternoon, was Stations of the Cross in the parish that we grew up in, right? And sometimes if it was an early spring, that, that Sunday afternoon, real warm, the church doors were open, and the Eidenbrooks in the fields right across from the church, they were out there working up land already, you know, uh, which they should have been doing on a Sunday anyhow, if they were good practicing Catholics, right? So, but it, it was a time for repentance, and uh, various ascetical practices, and it was all, the whole purpose, of course, was for us to have change of heart. Metanoia. And so we have all kinds of Lenten songs. Change my heart this time, right? You can uh, sing it next week or the first Sunday. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so the, like the 40 days. Uh, and of course the the, the practices, traditional uh, disciplines, right? Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. So, prayer. Of course, a lot of times... had extra masses, uh, stations of the cross, of course, uh, a practice. Uh, some parishes had Lenten adult uh, uh, education series or like many retreat experiences uh, in the parish, parish missions of various kinds. Uh, 40 hours, 40 hours. 
40 hours uh, devotions uh, or 13 hour de devotions with uh, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Okay, right? Other prayer experiences? Uh, A lot of parishes have those little, little blue book or black books, okay, from from the diocese of uh, Saginaw, Michigan, Michigan, uh, and they and a wonderful little five six minute a day reflections with interesting facts and stories, right? Kind of like this Bible study, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, you throw me off. Uh, and we get off the track a little bit. Um, so, uh, different penitential practices. Some people pick up and, and start reading the Bible. That's why we encourage you to bring friends here. Okay? Many of you started. The anniversary of the start of this Catholic Bible study was probably during Lent, March and April, 1974. Five, off of men, men's retreat. That's right. So, um, and then fasting. Well, I spoke a lot about fasting already. Um, of course, we just studied Leviticus. And what did Leviticus have for the Jews concerning fasting? The Day of Atonement. Now, again, check out Leviticus chapter 16, right? The, almost the whole chapter. And, you know, what does that mean, atonement? And you break it down, at one man. Becoming at one again with, with Almighty God, with the Lord their God. So it was, it was like covenant renewal. And any uh, discipline, Lenten disciplines, or extra practices that you begin to use during Lent, uh, do you know, may it put you, the intent is you want to become renewed in your relationship or grow in your relationship with Almighty God. That's where metanoia comes in. A change of heart, a change of direction, a change of life, a change of lifestyle. Okay? But, I warn you, don't say, oh, oh, God. And, and, and then I'll lose weight. <laughs> fasting is not dieting. Dieting is not fasting. Even though you see on YouTube all the time now, the, you know, the popular intermittent fasting. They're wrong. Okay. Formal fasting is, yes, giving up certain foods, certain drinks, but for a higher purpose. And it's not for yourself. No. The main thing is to keep in mind, I'm doing this because there's people all over the world that are starving. There's people even here, you, there's, a, there's a program right now on one of the TV stations about Project Food or Food Project, right here in northeastern Wisconsin, people without uh, adequate nutrition. You know, uh, some of the programs that was pantry was the awareness of that. Loaves and fishes. Loaves and fishes. The awareness that there are people starving in our community, right? That's still going, right, Karen? Yes. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, free meals, community meals. Mm -hmm. where, where do they hold it now, Carol? St. Teresa's St. Community Center. At St. Teresa? And we serve from 530 to 630. 530, is, and about how many do they get? Uh, over 100. Over 100 percent. And it's open to anyone, you know, and it's free, right? Free. Yeah, no, loaves and fishes. So, um, and it's a, a wonderful, beautiful thing. But we do it, we can do it for ourselves. When we do make up our mind, we're going to fast, you know, certain days. You know, traditionally it was Fridays, right? Abstain from meat. And still, it's Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, fast and abstain. And next year, over 
49 years old or something. 49. <laughs> Uh, then you don't have to fast because you're, still abstain. uh, you're <laughs> heading towards old age. But you still abstain. You still should abstain. Okay. I remember some years ago I had an elderly parishioner. <laughs> I knew she was in her 80s. We started a pen. She came up after I had to ask when I do sermons. She said, Father, I'm 80. So on here, and I want you to know, for ever since I was seven years old, I gave up the same thing for Lent every single year. I said, what did you give up? Candy. <laughs> I said, from the looks of you, you only weigh 100 pounds, eat the candy. <laughs> Change it up. Okay? So that it becomes a holy sacrifice. And what's the term in Leviticus? Oblation. Oblation to the Lord. Huh? Uh, you don't have sheep or goats to kill anymore to offer. So, uh, as a matter of fact, eat something different. Muskrats. Muskrats. <laughs> Okay, so and, and so the other thing is uh, going to confession. Uh, confession. Oh, you know, originally pre-Lenten practice was going to confession before you start. Uh, and please, I've come to understand a lot of Catholics. Anymore. Number one, because priests don't preach about it. Number two, we don't provide the time for it. Number three, a lot of Catholics still have a, a, a child's understanding of the sacrament, unless you read in Catholic uh, periodicals and so on. It, 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 you know, a child's understanding. And so, it, 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 people, adults, uh, you know, break it down. Well, I'm not so bad. You know, I, I don't kill anybody, and I don't commit adultery. Well, last time we checked, there was ten commandments, not two, right? Huh? So, patterns of sin. What we used to call venial sins. Okay? A venial sin is a pattern of sinfulness and pretty soon you have you're, you're in a state that's far beyond the individual venial sin <coughs> all right moral sin most people don't know what moral sins are anymore you know skipping mass on holy day and mass is still called a moral sin all right unless you have to work every single hour and then, you know, try to go to a daily mass somewhere. Or you're puke sick, or you have to stay home and take care of someone who's puke sick. <laughs> so of course, you go out and you Mardi Gras the Saturday night before, and then you, you, you're, you're, you know, you got over served. That doesn't count, okay? You got an alcohol buzz, that doesn't count as puke sick. Uh, so. <laughs> So the venial sin, habits of sinfulness, little things, you know, words that you say, lies that you say. You know, a white lie is still a lie. You know, <laughs> virtue versus vice. A virtue is a habit of doing good. A vice is a practice, a habit of doing not good. Do it, that leads into a sinful state. I compared it to, you know, excuse me, but I grew up on a farm, okay. We raised a lot of young stock. All winter long, we had to clean out the barn and put it on a pile. One barrel, one wheelbarrow full at a time. Well, by the time spring was 
So, guess what? It's a big pile. You know, Usually around Memorial Day, when everyone was listening to, you know, the, the race, what's the big race, Indianapolis 500, huh? yeah. uh, we were shoveling, <laughs> we built up all winter, okay. Yes, yes. Where did it go? Out on the field. Out on the field, yeah, we can do that. Okay, now, now they can't hardly do that anymore. So, but please, you know, reconciliation is not just for that. And, you know, and people say, oh, Father, I haven't been a confessor in a long time. If I can, you know, you won't have enough time. Wrong. I'm a seasoned professional. <laughs> As a matter of fact, people should be going to confession on a far more consistent basis, at least every two weeks. No, at least then once a month. Shorter time. And here's the other thing, the most important thing for us as adults. When we really reflect on our, our lives, these sinful patterns in our life and we own up to it then we get and through the sacrament we get not only absolved from our sin we get the sacramental grace to strengthen that particular area of our life that's going to give us the grace to overcome that and if you make a good confession you'll have a firm Brand new, you feel like a million bucks, okay? But you want to stay in God's grace. You want to stay in that, okay? Ah, uh, I hope so. <laughs> Remember the first words of Jesus. Repent. Repent. That is before anything about love. Okay? The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Repent. Metanoia. All right? Own up to your sins. And it could, all those offerings in Leviticus over and over again, right? Those, uh, those uh, offerings. You don't have to kill a sheep, so you don't have to kill a goat, you don't have to bring in a couple doves and pigeons, you know, to bring their necks. <laughs> okay. You don't have to do that. Although, a stick of venison, sa venison sausage for the priest might have come in handy. <laughs> and, and then, Doc? Yeah, a good article in the Compass this week on yeah. confession. Yeah. Well, you must get a Compass early because I don't get it till if I'm lucky on Saturday. I get it in a small community there. <laughs> so, and then there's almsgiving. Uh, and almsgiving, uh, you know, Old Testament doesn't talk about almsgiving very much. It comes in, in during the Greek uh, period, just before the time of Christ, because the social status became more delineated. In the Greco-Roman Empire, social status became more delineated. And so, uh, almsgiving, giving to the poor, make no mistake about it. Uh, Tobit, chapter 4, verse 6 through 11, talks about uh, almsgiving. Uh, Sirach, give alms to the poor, uh, chapter 3, chapter 4. Uh, Daniel, as well, the efficacy of good works. Uh, but it, it's really in the gospel that you're going to hear on Ash Wednesday, uh, usually from Matthew, it goes through these three, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. It's in the context of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Listen carefully to, or read it ahead of time. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Right in the middle of the, and he goes through all, Jesus goes through all of this. And he says, he's come to take it to another level. Okay. So, very good. I hope that gives you a little better idea of, of Lent leading into it, everyone. And 
and uh, have a happy Lent. And hopefully we'll see you and a friend or two next week uh, when we will begin uh, Basic Bible. Thank you very much for coming, everyone.